logs are turning into flames. Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods as far as the... Matt, what is it? Matt, what do you see? Just tell, tell us what you're seeing, Matt. Sarah? 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 Some of the most fascinating areas of horror include found footage and analog style horror, where realism blurs the lines between fiction and reality. There are many popular names in this genre that have been thoroughly reviewed and analyzed. But far before some of the more modern titles were known, there was an era of this style of horror that was just convincing enough to put a countless number of people on edge. I like to call it the analog horror before analog horror. These were times where a simple broadcast caused nationwide panic, with the earliest occurrence happening in 1938. But before we get started, I want to let you guys know about a potential upcoming project that I'm working on. So I'm sure all of you guys remember the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared series. It's one of the classics. And I actually just figured out that last year they continued their series on a different platform. So I figured I might watch some of those videos to maybe do an analysis for a future video. The only issue was that the episodes are only available in the UK. But luckily, today's sponsor, Surfshark, came in just in time to help me out. Surfshark VPN is an app and browser extension that allows you to change your IP address, which can unblock content you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Using Surfshark, it took just one click of a button to switch to a UK IP address so I could finally watch the new Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared series. But that's not all Surfshark can do. This is pretty much a universal solution to get access to content that is geo-blocked. I've also used it to watch shows like The Office on Netflix, which I'm still pissed they removed in the US. Surfshark is also my go-to solution for staying safe online. When you're connected to Surfshark VPN, all your information is encrypted so no one will be able to snoop around on what you're doing. As you've seen from some of my past videos, I've had to do some digging to find and contact the subjects of my videos for interviews and whatnot. And honestly, finding them all was surprisingly easy. Maybe it wouldn't have been if they used Surfshark. So get Surfshark today, or I will find you. And if you want to go the extra mile to be super secure, Surfshark also has an add-on antivirus and alert system that'll send you real-time breach alerts if it has detected any of your personal data has been breached. And my favorite part is how affordable all of this is. All you need is one subscription, then you can share one account with an unlimited number of devices. They even have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's literally no risk in trying. I've had Surfshark for years now, and I've never looked back. Right now, you can get an exclusive Surfshark Black Friday deal by going to surfshark.deals/scaretheater and entering the promo code SCAREtheater to get up to six additional months for free. Now, back to the video. It was the day before Halloween in 1938. Orson Welles, the producer of a radio show, was preparing to air the Halloween episode of his radio series, The Mercury Theater on the Air. This was a weekly, hour-long show where they did live radio dramas. Today, they had something special planned. They had written an adaptation of the H.G. Wells novel, The War of the Worlds, from 1898, and were going to perform this live on air. The creativity in this, however, was that it was written to be presented as if it were a real news broadcast. At the time, something like this hadn't been done before. Just after 8 o'clock p.m., they went live. Not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia, causing a low pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. It started off as if it were a normal broadcast doing a weather report, followed by music from Ramon Raquello. We take you now to the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. After about a minute of this, the broadcast is interrupted by a news reporter who announces this. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The Later on in the broadcast, we are introduced to our two main characters. Carl Phillips, who will become our main commentator, and Professor Pearson, who is an astronomer weighing in on the events. Phillips and Pearson briefly tease the idea of aliens before Professor Pearson is informed that some type of large impact has just been made within a 20-mile radius of Princeton. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you a wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray of the Natural History Museum, New York. Quote, 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Seismograph registered shock of almost... Earthquake intensity occurring within a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate. 
Signed, Lloyd Gray, Chief of Astronomical Division. Phillips arrives at the site of the impact and finds a strange object in the ground. I can see of the object itself. Doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Minutes later, the situation intensifies as Phillips talks about the object opening and a monster equipped with tentacles emerging from it. Our eyes are left to imagination as we listen to the horrors that follow. Wait a minute, something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Lords are turning into flames. Oh, the whole field caught up by the woods. The fires are the gas tanks, tanks of the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. The next 20 minutes or so it depicts a graphic soundscape of shrieks and panic as Martians invade the planet and destroy everyone and everything that stands in their way. Near the end of this act, the perspective cuts to a new broadcaster who is broadcasting from a different station as he watches the destruction of the city. As he sits in terror, he describes the Martians releasing a poisonous smoke that is slowly killing everyone. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. As the smoke approaches him, he starts coughing until he goes silent. Uh, a hundred yards away, it's, it's, it's just a peak. Now, at this point, the broadcast had been playing for roughly 37 minutes. It was at around this point that the executive producer of the show was called out of the studio to take a phone call. Just a few minutes later, he returned looking extremely anxious. He informed them that he was just ordered to immediately interrupt the broadcast to announce that everything that was happening was fictional. The act finished up, and this message was aired. You are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, this is where the details get a little fuzzy. If we go off what the crew of the show says happened, then this is the timeline of events. One of the actors on the show, Stephen Schnabel, says that when the broadcast resumed, policemen started flooding into the radio station, in a moment of chaos, there was a struggle between the police and CBS executives to keep them from stopping the show from continuing. One of the producers later said that after the broadcast finished, he received a phone call from the mayor of a midwestern town where there were mobs filling the streets panicking over this. Back at the station where the broadcast was played, there were angry people from the press in hysterics telling them that there was a fatal stampede in a Jersey Hall and even suicides that resulted from this. Because of how much commotion was going on, the cast had to leave the CBS building from the back entrance. But the outrage didn't stop there. Within just a few weeks, newspapers had published over 12,000 articles about the broadcast. Some critics were even calling for regulation by the FCC. As a result, Orson Welles ended up apologizing for the broadcast, insisting that he did not think this would be the outcome. I had almost no sleep, and I, I know less about this than you do. I haven't read the papers. Except okay, what was the first hope you had? I had every hope that, uh, that the people would be excited as they would be at a melodrama. But... The broadcast left a big mark on history, but in hindsight, it seems a little strange that a simple radio broadcast could truly cause this much panic. A lot of research has been done into the event to figure out exactly why this happened. Many people believe this may have actually been a cultural phenomenon of the time. A study by The Radio Project found that less than a third of the frightened listeners actually understood that the show was about aliens. Most of them thought they were listening to reports of a German invasion or a natural disaster of some sort. And it makes sense when you consider the time. This all happened just before World War II. For the entire month prior to the broadcast, radio stations were constantly keeping people on their toes by talking about the worrisome things happening in Germany at the time. It could be argued that the outrage is more of a manifestation of the Americans' anxieties rather than actual outrage at the broadcast itself. It is also understood that most of the outrage reported in the newspapers was heavily exaggerated for sensationalism. More recent research indicates that the show this was broadcast on wasn't even all that popular, so not many people actually heard it. 
The night of the broadcast, a survey was conducted by a radio rating service. They called 5,000 households, and only 2% of them said they were listening to the radio play, and none of them indicated that they thought it was a real news broadcast. And of the nearly 2,000 letters mailed to Wells and the FCC after the broadcast, only about 27% of them came from frightened listeners. In fact, there were plenty of other controversial broadcasts in that time period that received many more protest letters than this. We also have conflicting reports from other people at that time. Ben Gross, a radio editor for the New York Daily News, wrote in his 1954 memoir that the streets were nearly deserted when he made his way to the studio for the end of that broadcast. This is very different from what we heard earlier. A writer of a letter that the Washington Post published also recalls that there were no mobs in the street. So while there undoubtedly was a lot of fear caused from this broadcast, it was likely nowhere near what most people would suggest. One thing that is for certain is that Wells definitely made an impact so large that it would influence another similar event that occurred on CBS five decades later. In 1994, CBS aired a program called Without Warning, taking inspiration from the Orson Welles broadcast. Following the same format, the show begins with what looks like a normal movie playing, before being interrupted with what looks like a real news broadcast, informing the audience of three seismic events reported in the Northern Hemisphere. We interrupt this program for a special bulletin. Here now is Sandy Hill. Seismologists at Caltech now report at least three separate seismic events tonight, each in the Northern Hemisphere with earth tremors of magnitude 8.5 and above. Shortly afterward, we're introduced to the main news anchor covering these events, Sander Vonnegut. He tells us that a massive asteroid broke apart, hitting the earth in Wyoming, France, and China. A reporter at the crash site in Wyoming gives us an overview of just how catastrophic the damage is before they suddenly discover a survivor. What you're looking at now is, is the crater itself. A massive inferno is the only way you could describe this. Come on, Billy. My let's God, go down. It's a human We've got being. Let's go, let's go get her. Come on, Billy. Okay. A badly burned little girl is quickly approached by the news team as they try to get her help. She mutters something unintelligible to the camera before being taken away to the hospital to be treated. The broadcast continues with more journalists scrambling to keep the public informed when we learn that not only is the government taking great interest in this, but they are being awfully secretive about it. As you can see, dozens of investigators from NASA and the Pentagon have been flown into the site which is now beginning to resemble a small air base. Additional troops armed with assault weapons. Why the government would need firepower like that at the site of a meteor impact is anybody's guess. The FAA has now established a no-fly zone immediately over the crater. They've made it quite clear that anyone violating this restriction would be fired upon, so these are the last pictures you're likely to see for a while. All we learn is that a NASA scientist named Dr. Avram Mendel is suddenly flown out on a military chopper to the Houston Space Center. This in itself wasn't too noteworthy until we learned that Mendel was a founding member of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute. Well, according to his bio, he is a founding member of SETI. Does that mean extraterrestrials were involved? Like I said at the beginning, there are no questions. Come on, Dale, give it. Well, no. The next 30 minutes of the broadcast follows the reporters debating about the existence of alien life with scientists and people on the streets, before we are informed that another, much larger object was detected moving toward Earth. The US government has two aircraft sent up to intercept the objects before impact, and while they are successful, they lose contact with the pilots in the process. I too, Johnny. Five. We're two. losing video on India 1. Oh, India 2, do you copy? We have a copy. Oh, it seems, like, it seems like we've had a direct India hit on the asteroid, but there's some concern here that we've lost the image of the cockpit. As the program approaches its climax, we hear from Dr. Avram Mendel for the first time as he enters the Houston Space Center. He confirms his beliefs that this was an act of aliens and expresses extreme disapproval in the way that we handled this. They came in the way that they chose to come, in peace at first. What I'm saying is that we have made a preemptive strike, people. We have just declared war. When he exits the space center about 10 minutes later, 
he tells the press he has resigned from his position before hitting us with this bone-chilling update on the situation. Dr. Mandel, you mentioned before that this is an ongoing crisis. What did you mean by that? You don't know? No. At approximately 10.32 p.m. Eastern Time, the radio telescope hit, um, at Goldstone Mojave received a signal. There are three asteroids of a magnitude of two miles each and above that are on a trajectory with Earth. The asteroids are expected to hit sometime around 10.52 p.m. Eastern Time. That's it's nine minutes from now. In an anxiety-inducing buildup, the Space Center plans to calculate the trajectory of the incoming asteroids so they can launch a missile to deflect each of them. The moment of truth comes, and they are successful. The Space Center cheers in celebration, along with the news studio and people all around the world. Then, in a final twist, the cheering in the Space Center suddenly stops. The broadcast cuts back to the reporter in the Houston Space Center, who expresses confusion about the sudden silence. Then, this iconic scene happens. Carolyn, as you can see, the elation in the room behind me has stopped. People were cheering and celebrating, and then it was as if a balloon would burst. The quiet permeated the room, and nobody seems to be giving any indication why. Matt, what is it? Matt, what do you see? Just tell, tell us what you're seeing, Matt. The cam what's, the, what, what, what's the cameraman's name? I'm told his name is Patrick. Patrick, Patrick, just move the camera to the screen. Show us what you're seeing on the screen. Patrick, do you read the... Open Show silos. us what's on the... Track trajectories. No, there's too many. There's too many to calculate. Now, oh my God. France, this is Houston. France, do you copy? France, this is Houston. Come in, please. Uh, no round reports. We have picked up a... Do you copy? The broadcast ends with Sander Vonnegut sitting in the studio, resigning to fates, before signing off with a Shakespeare quote. I can only leave you with this thought from Shakespeare. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars. But in ourselves. Now, this one didn't have quite as big of an effect as the Orson Welles broadcast did, but it still caused a certain degree of panic in some people. From one perspective, this might make a little sense, since at the time, this was aired as if it were a real broadcast. One thing that made it slightly convincing was that most of the reporters in the show were real reporters who played as themselves, including Sander Vonnegut, Brie Walker, and Sandy Hill. On the other hand, there were also some actors in this who were well known for other popular roles, like the reporter who played Q from Star Trek. But there is one thing that I just don't understand how anyone missed. CBS made it very clear that this was not real. At the start of their broadcast, they announced that this was fiction, and during every ad break, they once again reminded the audience that this was fiction. In some locations, they even had a graphic that would periodically appear on screen during the show that reminded people this was not real. Yet, somehow, this was lost on a few people. The CBS affiliate in Fort Smith, Arkansas reported that they received dozens of calls asking if the events they were seeing were actually happening. Even other news channels in Arkansas were getting calls about it. ABC, Fox, and NBC all said they received a lot of calls from people asking why they weren't covering the news about the asteroid impacts on CBS. There are even plenty of comments made on the internet from people claiming they remember their friends and relatives freaking out over this when it was first aired. One Reddit comment even claims that the panic in his town was so bad that it made the front page of their local newspaper. But these types of mock newscasts weren't specific to the United States. This was an international genre, which brings us to our final broadcast that shook the people of the United Kingdom when the mockumentary Ghost Watch aired in 1992. This is the broadcast that made the largest impact of anything on this list, resulting in the loss of life and the subsequent banning of the program. Quick disclaimer here, in the original version of this video, I actually played some clips from the movie to paint the scene better, but unfortunately this resulted in the video getting a copyright strike, so I had to edit out every part where I featured a clip from the movie. Everything should still make sense for the most part, but it's just not exactly as good as what I had originally envisioned. If you do want to see the full unedited video, then it is available on my Patreon page. Ghost Watch aired on the BBC on the Halloween of 1992. It opens like a legitimate live documentary, and tries to play like it is one. 
In reality, this was all pre-recorded. At the open, we introduce to our host, Michael Parkinson, who tells us that this program is going to try and document evidence of the supernatural. He is accompanied by a psychologist interested in the paranormal named Dr. Lynn Pasco, and a field reporter, Sarah Green. The area they are investigating is a home that inhabits a woman named Pamela Early and her two daughters, Suzanne and Kim. They have been experiencing paranormal activity for the past 10 months and want to show the world what is happening. The show also had a telephone number on screen that people could call if they wanted to share their own experiences. This number was really the only thing that would hint viewers toward this broadcast being fictional. The idea was that if anyone called the number, they would be greeted with a message telling them that the show is a work of fiction. The only issue with this was that there were so many people calling in and only five telephone operators, so most people only heard a busy line, which reinforced in their minds that this was all real. The early portion of the show featured the field reporter, Sarah Green, getting details on the case from the family. We learned that a lot of the activity taking place took the form of strange noises coming from the walls and eerie things the kids experienced. Kim has dubbed this ghost Pipes. One of the main areas of paranormal activity is this boarded up area under the stairs. Pamela tells the reporter that this was an area where her ex-husband used to develop photos. She calls this room the glory hole, but I'd rather not call it that, so we're just gonna call it the boarded up room. Pamela tells the reporter of an eerie experience she had there one time. A lot of the show plays like any ghost investigation, taking note of strange occurrences, like a strange figure being seen in some of the footage, scratch marks on Suzanne's face, and a damp, circular spot on the rug. About an hour into the show, we hear banging noises erupting from the house. Sarah Green goes to investigate and finds that Suzanne is the one making the noises. She appears very upset and denies that she had anything to do with this before the footage cuts back to the studio. At this point, everyone assumes this was just a hoax. Just as we are sure everything is wrapping up, a series of anonymous callers put together the true backstory behind the ghost, Pipes. We learn that he was a disturbed individual named Raymond Tunstall, who believed he was possessed by a Victorian baby farmer named Mother Seddens. Tunstall ended up ending his life in the boarded up room in that house, where his body was eaten by cats. At this point, everything just goes full paranormal activity. The banging starts up again, the lights go haywire, and throughout all the commotion, Suzanne disappears to later be heard calling out from inside the boarded up room before the camera cuts out. The psychologist in the studio theorizes that the ghost has used the nationwide broadcast to create some sort of massive seance to manifest itself through. At this point, the police are called to the house to evacuate everyone. They are able to extract Pamela, Kim, and one of the TV crew members, but Sarah and Suzanne are still missing. The camera cuts again to footage coming from inside the house, where Sarah is still trying to save Suzanne. Now the chaos is extended from the house into the studio. Lights are breaking, wind is blowing everywhere, people are exiting the studio, and then the studio loses power completely. The final scene is of Michael Parkinson confusingly wandering around the dark studio before becoming possessed by pipes. Then the show ends. Like I said before, the impact this broadcast made is greater than all the other ones on this list. After the show aired, tens of thousands of complaints were made to the BBC. A lot of people truly believed this was real. Even the ones who realized it wasn't real still were not happy with this. They felt they had trust in the BBC and thought that being duped like this destroyed all trust. You betrayed the trust that the audience has within the BBC. You toyed with the emotions of the audience because the audience weren't actually sure, or I wasn't, but actually sure if it was fact or fiction, if it was live or if it was in fact a drama. In the midst of all the backlash, there were also reports of people who watched the show and thought it was proof of an afterlife, so they ended their own to be with their loved ones. Most of these claims can't really be proven, but there is one sad story here that is true. The night the show aired, a couple in Nottingham named April and Percy Denham were watching the show with their two sons, Gavin, 14 years old, and Martin, 18 years old. Martin had a learning disability and a mental age of 13. When the family was watching the show, Martin became more and more agitated as it went on. The father described him as being hypnotized by it. The parents say that when the show ended, 
Martin started showing odd behavior. He was more fearful of noises coming from the pipes in the house and became entranced with the talk of ghosts. The parents tried to make sure he was okay, but clearly something went wrong. Five days later, Martin was found lifeless on a tree near his home. There was a note in his pocket that read, If there are ghosts, I will now be one, and I will always be with you as one. The parents were understandably devastated and blamed the show for this. The Denham family fought for this to be investigated by the Broadcasting Standards Commission. The producers of the show argued that placing more obvious messages indicating that the show was fake would have ruined the effect. But the commission concluded that it was their duty to make it more clear that the show was fictional. Not much legal action was actually taken though. As a result of all the backlash the show received, the airing of the show was banned for 10 years, but even today, it has never aired again. It's only available on DVD and streaming. With all the modern analog horror we see today, it's important to remember the OGs of the time. One thing unique about these broadcasts is that they would never work today. It would take just a minute to Google and figure out what's going on. But for what they did for the time, it made an impact. Some for better, some for worse. What's for sure though is that they will all be remembered. Thank you for watching, and I will see you on the flip side.